All right, the grand finale. Yeah. Let's uh, open with a word of prayer. Blessed Lord, you have caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant that we may in such wise hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that by patience and comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given in our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, ever one God, world without end. Amen. Okay, Isaiah 65. I was ready to be sought by those who did not ask for me. I was ready to be found by those who did not seek me. I said, here I am, here I am, to a nation that was not called by my name. I spread out my hands all the day to a rebellious people who walk in a way that is not good, following their own devices a people who provoke me to my face continually, sacrificing in gardens and making offerings on bricks, who sit in tombs and spend the night in secret places, who eat pig's flesh and broth of tainted meat is in their vessels. Let's stop right there. Uh, we have seen throughout the book of Isaiah uh, the great irony, and uh, this is very much crystallized in the New Testament, of uh, God continually holding out his hand to his people who are called by his name, who are a member of his covenant, who have his worship and have every advantage, and they continually reject him. And so, especially in Isaiah, uh, God promises that he will extend his hands to all of the nations and uh, that uh, he will know a people that's not called by his name, a people who did not seek him. Uh, we see clearly what this means when Christ comes, when he's rejected by his own people, um, and then the gospel spreads to the Gentiles. And uh, St. Paul will quote uh, these first two verses in Romans uh, when he speaks of Israel's rejection. That's, uh, you know, I hold out my hands to this disobedient and contrary people, but then I include people not called by my name as my people. Now, uh, he enumerates some of the sins of the people who've rejected him. And he says, they provoke me to my face continually. And uh, verse 3, what they have done, sacrificing in gardens, making offerings on bricks, sitting in tombs, spending the night in secret places, eating pig's flesh and broth of tainted meat. Uh, so the way that uh, Isaiah pictures it is, uh, he's using the language, of course, of the Old Covenant. And the, the point really being that these people are unclean. We saw that in the last chapter, that we've all become like one who is unclean. All our so-called righteous deeds are filthy garments. And uh, so he, he uses some of those things. Sacrificing in gardens, uh, it's very clear from the law of Moses uh, that God does want his people to perform the sacrifices. But God specifically says, you're not allowed just to sacrifice anywhere. Mm -hmm. In that time, you know, they had the tabernacle. Eventually they have the temple. Uh, but uh, the sacrifices are to be conducted according to the liturgy that God gives his people. And uh, which is one reason I'm a stickler about our liturgy today. Uh, because when you start making exceptions to things, other things sneak in. Yeah. And so better to be stodgy about it. But that's a that's a problem that bedevils all of Israel because it goes from, well, I can sacrifice wherever I want. I can sacrifice up on this high place. And then somehow up there on the high place, we've exchanged, you know, the worship of God for the worship of Baal or something like that. Um, and it really, most of it goes back to, you should have just stuck with what God said in the beginning. Um, but this is what they've done. They've sacrificed in places that they shouldn't. And uh, they sit in tombs. Now, the, the dead were ceremonially unclean. Right. You were not to touch a dead person. <laughs> yeah. So it's not just that uh, my people accidentally touched a dead person and then they didn't go through like the necessary purification, but they've camped out, you mm -hmm. know, in the tombs. And uh, there might be some connection with whatever worship practice that they're engaging in. Um, so they, they, have, um, they have this weird thing with death. Uh, and we know that it's death to, to reject God and his word. 
Uh, but this is what they've done. They've eaten pig's flesh, which we know the pigs are not kosher. Uh, so they have done everything to make themselves unclean. Uh, now the ironic thing is verse 5. These are the same people who say, Keep to yourself, do not come near to me, for I am too holy for you. These are a smoke in my nostrils, a fire that burns all the day. Behold, it was written before me, I will not keep silent, but I will repay. I will indeed repay into their lap both your iniquities and your father's iniquities together, says the Lord. Because they have made offerings on the mountains and insulted me on the hills, I will measure into their lap payment for their former deeds. So I am too holy for you, which is very interesting. Because they're speaking to God, you know. Yeah. Uh, well, I think what we're to take that to mean, um, I'm good. I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. And, uh, and therefore, like, there's nothing that I've done that you need to call me, you know, to account for. There's no sin that needs to be exposed or confessed or atoned for. But I am holy. And the ironic thing is uh, you cannot plead your holiness to God. That would be tantamount to saying to God, I am too holy for you. Uh, yeah, it was quite insane. Um, the other thing, and I think this is next chapter, but one of the things that unfaithful Israel continually hides behind is uh, the fact that they have the temple. And Jeremiah will rebuke them for this in um, Jeremiah 7, where he says, do not presume to say the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. And uh, outwardly, we know that there are plenty of people in Israel and Judah who abided by the outward letter of the religious law. Uh, God knows better. And what God rebukes them for here is that they worship me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Uh, so they're, they're actually doing the polar opposite of everything in secret. And then they say, no, I'm holy. I'm good. You can keep away from me and keep your law and your judgment um, and the, you know, the condemnation of my sin. Keep that to yourself, God, if you don't mind. Also, you know, what are you doing? Yeah. It's always relevant, always timely. Uh, so, but God says that he will... Uh, Yep, he will, he'll get them. Uh, and because he, he has to, you know, he has to be true to himself too. Uh, verse 8, thus says the Lord, as the new wine is found in the cluster, and they say, do not destroy it, for there is a blessing in it. So I will do for my servant's sake, and not destroy them all. I will bring forth offspring from Jacob, and from Judah, possessors of my mountains. My chosen shall possess it, and my servants shall dwell there. Sharon shall become a pasture for flocks, and the valley of Achor a place for herds to lie down, for my people who have sought me. But you who forsake the Lord, who forget my holy mountain, who set a table for fortune and fill cups of mixed wine for destiny, I will destine you to the sword, and all of you shall bow down to the slaughter, because when I called you did not answer, when I spoke you did not listen. But you did what was evil in my eyes and chose what I did not delight in. All right, so we do have grace and mercy here. And uh, he uses the image as new wine is found in the cluster. Uh, the people say, do not destroy it for there is blessing in it. And he says, so I will do for my servant's sake. Verse 8. This is something that uh, we've seen before from God. That... Uh, God has judgment to mete out, and with it comes a measure of destruction and desolation and punishment. Uh, but the state of his people is like the grapes uh, in a ripe cluster, where uh, he could just as well, if he doesn't want the vineyard anymore, he can just destroy it and tear it down. And that's actually something we saw at the beginning of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 5 is where God compares Israel to the vineyard and he goes for his vintage and he did not get what he wanted. He got sour grapes. So he said, fine, then I will destroy the watchtower. I'll destroy um, the, the hedge, the wall around it, and we'll cut down, you know, because it's not produced the, the grapes that I wanted. 
So he could well do that. Uh, but there are some good grapes. <laughs> there's some bad eggs, there's some good eggs. And uh, for the sake of the good ones, he will not destroy the entire cluster. Uh, and this, again, is the pattern that God always follows because of who he is. Now, sometimes the good grapes are infinitesimal. Eight people saved from a worldwide flood. That, that's a pretty small cluster to say. <laughs> but nevertheless, he does that, you know. Uh, that gives you a, yeah, he did. And, and it gives you a fairly good indication that there are only about eight righteous people on the earth at the time. Uh, but, but God does spare them. It would, it would be wrong and beneath God uh, to, to sweep away the wicked with the righteous. And that's what Abraham tells him. When, when God and the two angels, when they come to Abraham in Genesis 18, he knows what God wants to do to Sodom and Gomorrah. And, he, and Abraham says, far be it from you to sweep away the wicked with the evil. And then he bargains with God. He's like, if there were 50 righteous, you wouldn't destroy the city, right? He's like, I would not. 45? No, I keep 45. And Abraham works them all the way down to 10. And God says, for the sake of 10 righteous, I will not destroy the cities. The fact that he destroys them gives you some idea. <laughs> I, I mean, at least when the angels go. He's just hoping to get Right, yeah. And even even that small little uh, segment gets smaller because Lot's sons-in-law think he's kidding. So mm -hmm. you lose two there. And then you lose Lot's wife on the way out because she mm -hmm. had to look back. Yeah. She had to, because she had a little bit of longing, you know, in her heart. Mm -hmm. And then, so that leaves Lot and his two daughters and we know that that has a kind of icky yeah. um, end. So, which does go to show that the world can rub off on you. So really, by, by the end of it, I suppose you could say, I guess there were three, Lot and his two daughters. Um, well, even in Jesus and his, um, and his parables, when he says that uh, you have to let the wheat and the weeds grow together right. until the judgment, uh, your garden might look kind of overgrown, but uh, when the time comes for the harvest and for the reaping, then God himself makes that distinction between those who are truly of the church and those who are not. But he's not going to pull up the wheat because if he pulls up the wheat, he's going to, or the, I'm sorry, if he pulls up the weeds, he's going to pull up the wheat with them. Uh, so we don't want him to do that. Uh, so that's, this is the same uh, pattern that he's following here. And, and we're thankful for that. Uh, in marked contrast, though, to, uh, to those who forget his holy mountain and therefore forget his worship and his covenant, you know, because they're on the mountain as the temple. Uh, they, uh, they are religious people. They're right about that. And uh, they've set a table for fortune, filled cups of mixed wine for destiny. And the, the identity of fortune and destiny, apart from being pagan gods, is not entirely clear. Uh, but not Yahweh. We know that. Um, and I'm not sure, I'd have to look again at the language, but I at least see in English, there's a play on words. Uh, you fill cups of mixed wine for destiny. So, verse 12, I will destine you to the sword. Uh, so he will he'll mete out his judgment. Uh, there's always a, a punishment for idolatry. Okay, uh, verse 13. And you stop me at any time, man. I'm just blitzing through so we can... <laughs> We'll, we'll absorb rapidly again. Uh, 13. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, my servants shall eat, but you shall be hungry. Behold, my servants shall drink, but you shall be thirsty. Behold, my servants shall rejoice, but you shall be put to shame. Behold, my servants shall sing for gladness of heart, but you shall cry out for pain of heart and shall wail for breaking of spirit. And, and here's in part why, 15. You shall leave your name to my chosen for a curse. And the Lord God will put you to death, but his servants he will call by another name, so that he who blesses himself in the land shall bless himself by the God of truth. And he who takes an oath in the land shall swear by the God of truth, because the former troubles are forgotten and are hidden from my eyes. So here again, uh, the, the unfaithful, they will be... Hungry, thirsty, they'll be put to shame. 
uh, they will wail, they'll cry out in pain. Because you leave your name, the name of the people of God, to my chosen for a curse. So they have put off the name that God has given to them. Um, that, uh, that God has called them his children, you know, that he's named them for Israel, or traced their lineage to Abraham. Uh, and Abraham, you know, the father of the multitude, uh, then the, all the nations of the earth are to be blessed through Abraham. God's people have put this off uh, because they have treated this like this is a curse. The, the very opposite of what it is and what God had said. Because God had said to Abraham, I will bless those who bless you, I'll curse those who curse you. Um, that only applies insofar as they believe you know, the promise that God makes. So, looking forward, we know that the way that this happens is that, uh, that they put off their name by rejecting the Messiah. And it just so happens that uh, that only leaves one group of people to pick it up. And that would be the Gentiles, you know, who come to faith in Christ. That's a trend that by and large in the last 2,000 years has still continued which is not because Gentiles are so great, uh, but it's, it's rather because um, God will be faithful to his covenant, to his promises. And Israel is constituted of all those who have faith in Christ and are baptized into his name. Um, so there hasn't been any kind of, sometimes people say they've been replaced. You know, Gentiles have replaced the Jews. It's not that they anybody's been replaced, it's that God continues to add to his people. Um, that this is what Israel really is, that this, this is what it means to be, you know, the son of Abraham. Um, so, but they throw it off as a curse and it will be picked up. Uh, yes. So that uh, he who blesses himself in the land shall bless himself by the God of truth. Uh, all right. Verse 17. We have the introduction of the new heavens and the new earth. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come into mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem to be a joy and her people to be a gladness. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people. No more shall be heard in it the sound of weeping and the cry of distress. No more shall there be in it an infant who lives but a few days or an old man who does not fill out his days. For the young man shall die a hundred years old, and the sinner a hundred years old shall be accursed. Okay, uh, the new heavens and the new earth, I did give you on your sheet if you want to look at it sometime. There are two explicit references in Isaiah. They both come here, uh, one in 65, one in 66. It's a phrase that St. Peter picks up on, Second Peter 3, when he says, we're waiting for new heavens and new earth in which righteousness dwells. And then Revelation 21, toward the end of John's vision, um, he sees the new heavens and the new earth. And he sees New Jerusalem coming down and all these things. Uh, Isaiah is now, because he's wrapping things up, he's looking toward, you know, the ultimate end and this work of new creation that God is going to do. Uh, because this is a prophecy, um, th there are many levels of meaning in things. And I think the key to understanding some of the things he says about the new creation is to understand that while there is certainly, and we couldn't never deny this, um, that uh, there is going to be a literal, physical new heaven and new earth, um, that's a reality that has already begun, that begins in the person and the work of Jesus himself. Uh, life from the dead is new creation. And uh, we speak of, of being regenerated, being born again, when we're united to the death and resurrection of Christ through baptism. Uh, and Paul says it well in 2 Corinthians, uh, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. So that is the beginning, you know, that is like the inbreaking of that final reality that's coming. So we live in an interesting tension where our sin is forgiven, our death is defeated, and yet the, the outward trappings of those things still kind of adhere to us and to our world. So why I say all of that is because some of the ways in which he describes in Isaiah the new heaven and the new earth um, are kind of odd. And I think it, it's, it would be difficult to take these things 
completely literally at face value. So a good example of this is what he says about the infant and the old man. Uh, 20, no more shall there be in it an infant who lives but a few days or an old man who does not fill out his days. For the young man shall die a hundred years old and the sinner a hundred years old shall be accursed. All right, now we know in the eternal state when Christ comes again um, and we live forever and have eternal life uh, that uh, there is not going to be any death. Um, so it would be an odd way to describe. So obviously, in the new creation, uh, there will be no death. So it, it's kind of odd then to hear what Isaiah says about the new creation, that uh, the old man or the young man won't die until he's at least 100, and the sinner who dies at 100 will be accursed. And uh, see, this is why I think it calls for some you know, reading this in a spiritual way, which again, it doesn't detract from, you know, the literal meaning of the new heaven and the new earth. Uh, so, yes, sir. Yeah, 65, verse 20. Mm -hmm. Good morning, Glenn. I'm great. How about you? Good to see you. Yeah, those I don't have any of, I'm afraid. Uh, all right. So there's a number of ways that I think that you could take it. And uh, the one that I'm partial to is to say that we know that uh, when Jesus comes, uh, because he's, he's the fulfillment of, uh, of everything. Uh, he's brought God's revelation. Um, how would we say it? Well, he brings us to our full maturity in him. Uh, that uh, we have finally, in Christ, we grow up into all that we're called to be. And uh, and humanity, I think, in a sense, comes of age. Uh, Adam and Eve were not of age when uh, they fell. By, by which I mean, you know, we know that the scripture says Eve was deceived by the serpent. So, she did sin, but that's not the same thing as like a hard-hearted, willful rebellion, fully knowing well, you know, that the serpent's lying. Um, where humanity is moving toward is, is that, that what St. Paul calls mature manhood in Christ. That's why we'll never fall away again. You know, we don't have to worry about that in the new heaven and the new earth. Uh, but uh, he says that the infant will not die young. Uh, but we'll, we'll live and fill out his days. And I just take that to mean that uh, we finally grow up, you know, into, into the fullness of, of knowing God for who he is. So that's just how I take it. Um, there could be something that's eluding me. But All right, verse 21. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For like the days of a tree shall be the days of my people. And my chosen shall long enjoy the works of their hands. They shall not labor in vain or bear children for calamity. For they shall be the offspring of the blessed of the Lord and their descendants with them. Before they call, I will answer. While they're yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall graze together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox. The dust shall be the serpent's food. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountains, says the Lord. All right. Now, we've heard plenty in Isaiah about uh, how the people are displaced. You know, one person builds, another inhabits. You know, they, they lose everything. Their vineyards are destroyed. Um, they're taken into exile. But uh, the image that, that God gives then of the new creation is that when you build, you get to keep your home. Uh, that uh, there won't be any invader, there won't be any traitor or anything like that. Uh, and their days will be like the days of a tree. You know, trees can get to be very ancient. Uh, I've never gotten to see any of like, you know, like the redwood trees, you know, California, those are that big. I remember years ago, growing up, we went to the Joyce Kilmer National Forest um, in North Carolina, all kinds of trees there. Uh, but trees, you know, can get to be very ancient. 
And uh, he says that the days of his people are like the days of, the, of a tree. Um, and uh, my chosen shall long enjoy the work of their hands. Then he switch images, switches images in 23. They won't labor in vain or bear children for calamity, for they shall be the offspring of the blessed of the Lord. Uh, the, the image of labor and birth and delivery is something that's used throughout the scriptures. And what he means to say then is uh, they won't labor in vain. In other words, there is no miscarriage, right? There's no abortion of the child. Uh, but uh, the, the purpose for labor and delivery will be accomplished. Uh, that, uh, as Jesus says, uh, he says, you know, uh, a woman is in great sorrow and travail because her hour has come, you know, when she has to give birth to a child. But then comes the joy that a human being has been born into the world. Labor and delivery, apart from a, from a child, would be an absolute horror. Uh, but this, these things have a purpose, right? And, and this is true also. Jesus is making the comparison to his own death when he's taken away. Uh, it is, it's a terrible thing, you know, that Jesus dies. But the end result is the joy of the resurrection and the beginning of the new creation. So he says uh, there, is a, there is a point then to the labor uh, that uh, the woman, so to speak, doesn't bear children for calamity. And he'll say this again in the next chapter uh, when he says, I, the Lord, if I, if I bring the labor, I will also bring the delivery of the child. In other words, God fulfills his promise. And there's an end to all of these other things, to sorrow, to sin and death. And uh, so that's what we have to look forward to. Um, so life is every day. Yes, sir. <laughs> every day we have, we toil, we have hardships, but every day we have joy too. But mm -hmm. this is all just the labor leading up to the delivery, the delivery of the, the final heaven. That's right. Paradise. Yeah, yeah, that's well put. And some days the contractions are worse than others. <laughs> You're like, it can't really get any worse than that. Not that I've ever felt contractions, you know. But uh, anyway, that, and I'm told they intensify. So since I've seen you, I've had three children. Uh, since the, yeah, three children yeah, three yeah. Our first was born just when we were leaving Reese, and he's three years old. And uh, our youngest is uh, just turned four months, actually. So uh, thank you. Yeah, they are. Until they're teenagers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's always a contraction, you know, that leads to the. All right. So anyway, all right. Last last verse in sixty five. The wolf shall or the wolf and the lamb shall graze together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox. Dust shall be the serpent's food. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, says the Lord. Now I know generally what people want to do with this. Uh, they want to say. You know, when Christ comes back and he restores everything the way that it ought to be, you'll be able to look out your window, you know, of the mansion that Jesus has prepared for you, and you'll be able to literally see, you know, the wolf and the sheep playing together and the lion eating straw like an ox. Now, that might be, and I don't discount that, you know. I would love to, I'd love to be able to, you know, just like pat a lion and not worry that I'm not going to get my hand back to me. So I'm not saying that won't happen, because we know that, that Christ will restore all creation. Uh, but Isaiah is a, is a prophetic and a deeply symbolic book, something that we've seen in Isaiah before. Um, and I put some of this in the notes. Is that uh, there are many unfavorable comparisons uh, to the Gentiles in general, and especially the Gentiles who are the enemies of the people of God. And they are called beasts, and wild animals. The enemies of God's people are often called wolves. And we know this from when Jesus sends out the twelve the first time. It would be Matthew chapter 10. He says, behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, right? You know what a wolf does to a sheep. That just so happens that that's the same image that he uses here. So now uh, the wolf and the lamb shall graze together. The lion eats like an ox. And then, uh, and I think this might be the key that, that we're to take this in a symbolic way. 
It says, dust shall be the serpent's food. Now you remember uh, the first time that the serpent is cursed to eat the dust. And it's not really so much a condemnation of the reptile, which I don't particularly like anyway, but uh, it's, it's God's condemnation of Satan, you know, for having led Adam and Eve into sin. Uh, on your belly you will go, dust you will eat all the days of your life. And he says, I will put hostility between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. And, uh, and he will, he'll bru you will bruise his heel, but he will crush your head. Um, and looking at all of the scriptures all together, we're not talking about the fact that, that women are naturally freaked out by snakes, but, but we're speaking of he who possesses the serpent, you know, who led our first parents into sin. The man who descends from the woman will destroy the serpent, um, that he'll defeat the devil, give us the forgiveness of our sins. So you see that here, uh, that the curse of the serpent is final. Dust shall be the serpent's food, and they will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. Pastor, yes, sir. Henry and I were just having this discussion last night in the cabin, and especially about the wolves and the sheep. And, uh, and I've, I've often thought what Pastor Mechus once said was, Nobody knows what heaven is going to be like, you know, when God destroys it, right? Destroys us and gives us a new world. There's not going to be any sin. There's no bloodshed. But he said maybe he gave us a glimpse of that in the Garden of Eden. Because that's what the Garden of Eden mm -hmm. was. There was no sin, there was no bloodshed. Mm -hmm. First bloodshed was when God had to kill an animal to close the matter. So, now, for what I'm getting from you is maybe this is just more prophetic coming out of Isaiah. Yeah, I think, so just to be clear, I, I do believe that there will be no more bloodshed and death, even in the animal kingdom in the new creation. I just think that sometimes, I, I think it's what Isaiah says might be misapplied. If, if we're reading... If we're reading Isaiah in context and we say, when it says the wolf shall lie down with the lamb, that, that the main point of that is actually, you know, literal animals. So I don't deny that that will be the case, but I think, I think the point of what Isaiah is saying is that uh, the people themselves are reconciled together. So people who seem to be natural enemies and that whole hostility between Jew and Gentile, uh, that is what will be resolved. Um, and that some who are, who are now the enemies of God, as St. Paul says, they walk as enemies of the cross of Christ, are beloved by God. Um, and uh, through the proclamation of the gospel, they, they, they can repent, they'll believe, you know, and they'll be um, brought into God's family. So that, that's at least what I think Isaiah means. And I think he's using that image um, that uh, that all of the, the, the enmity and the hostility will end. I think that's true of the animals. I just don't think that's the point of what he says here. Nice. So, yeah. No, I would, uh, I will enjoy being able to look at all these, you know, go on a safari and not have to worry. You know, I won't be, won't be eaten by a leopard or something. I don't know. Anyway, all right. So, I'd mentioned to Henry, usually I don't go this fast, but uh, we start Sunday school next week. So we have eight minutes. We're going to do Isaiah 66. This will be fun. All right. Thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What is the house that you would build for me? And what is the place of my rest? All these things my hand has made. And so all these things came to be, declares the Lord. But this is the one to whom I will look, he who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. Okay, and there's a hymn that's coming to mind. I think it's Alleluia, sing to Jesus. Earth your footstool, heaven your throne. Uh, there, here's where it's from. Now, why is God saying that heaven is his throne and earth is his footstool? Well, you see the question that he asks at the end of verse one. What is the house that you would build for me? And what is the place of my rest? 
uh, what we saw, what we see actually throughout Isaiah, is that the unfaithful in Israel and Judah, they hide behind their outward religiosity. You know, and they claim, well, I, I do, I make the sacrifices, I observe the customs, I do what I'm supposed to do. Um, but their heart is far from God, is what Isaiah says. They hide behind the temple. Uh, so God says, well, guess what? I don't need it. <laughs> I do not dwell, and, and Stephen tells them, this is what gets Stephen stoned, you know, by the Sanhedrin. He says, the Almighty does not dwell in temples built by human hands, nor is he served by them as if he had any need of them. And that's, that's the part of the sermon that gets him killed. But earth is uh, my footstool, heaven is my throne. Uh, you cannot build a house for God. Um, the temple was not God's idea. The temple was David's idea. And David, or God goes along with it. He said, okay, but just so you know, I will build you a house, David. And the house, he's not you know, speaking of a building, but uh, in his lineage, he will give a descendant of David to be the eternal king. So he will build the house, the family of David in that way. He's like, I will do you one better than whatever house that you think you can build. I'm not going to dwell in a house of cedar, you know, is what he said. So when you use the temple, you know, as your prop for, oh, well, I'm, I'm being obedient and faithful. God says, well, just so you know, I don't need it. Uh, and, uh, and sin will be exposed. So verse, but, you know, what he really wants is in verse two, he says, he who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. In other words, uh, those who believe, you know, uh, we pray in the offertory, create in me a clean heart, O God, renew a right spirit within me. And that's Psalm 51. It's the same psalm um, in which uh, David prays the, the sacrifices of God are a broken and contrite spirit. A broken and contrite spirit, O oh God, you will not despise. All right, verse 3. Uh, we're going to summarize a little bit. Uh, he says, he who slaughters an ox is like one who kills a man. Well, that's a very extreme statement. That's a very PETA thing to say. Um, what, what he does here is he talks about all these offerings and these sacrifices. Uh, and he's basically like, this is an abomination to me. Why would it be that if God's commanded it? Well, he explains um, that uh, they lack the faith. Um, and he says, how does he say it here? Well, verse 4, I also will choose harsh treatment for them and bring their fears upon them. Because when I called, when I spoke in my word, no one answered. When I spoke, they did not listen. It doesn't just mean I listen with the ear, but that faith which comes by hearing, they did not heed the word of God. And so if, if you don't believe, then all the other stuff is nonsense. Um, and uh, you, can, you can make all the sacrifices, but he said, um, sacrificing the ox apart from faith is like a, one who kills a man. So verse 5, uh, Hear the word of the Lord, you who tremble at his word. Your brothers who hate you and cast you out for my name's sake have said, Let the Lord be glorified that we may see your joy. But it is they who shall be put to shame. The sound of an uproar from the city, a sound from the temple, the sound of the Lord rendering recompense to his enemies. All right. So we're sounding the note of judgment here. Before she was in labor, she gave birth. So here's that image again. Before her pain came upon her, she delivered a son. Who has heard such a thing? Who has seen such a thing? Shall a land be born in one day? Shall a nation be brought forth in one moment? For as soon as Zion was in labor, she brought forth her children. Shall I bring to the point of birth and not cause to bring forth, says the Lord? Shall I who cause to bring forth shut the womb, says your God? So there's that image again. And it's, the, it's miraculous here. That the woman, he pictures God's people, Zion, as a woman in labor. And he says that uh, she, she gives birth even before the pain of labor has come upon her. He says, have you ever heard of something like this? And uh, what he's underscoring, I think, is that God delivers, if we could use the term, 
his people in this miraculous way. He does these things in an unexpected way. And it would be just as bizarre and miraculous as if a woman gave birth with no contraction, no labor pain, or anything like that. That, boop, you know, right out of the birth canal, no trauma. And uh, this is his comparison. Uh, and he's, again, shall I bring to the point of birth the not cause to bring forth? Shall I who cause to bring forth shut the womb? The, those are rhetorical questions. The answer is no, of course not. Uh, the God will be faithful. The, the God has not made us to be his people so that we can just be miscarried and tossed out. Uh, but he will be faithful. All right, I hate to do it. We are going to have to skip to the end. Uh, we will end, let's do 17 through the end. Actually, we'll, we'll back up to 15. So we have this picture of uh, the final judgment. Behold, the Lord will come in fire and his chariots like the whirlwind to render his anger and fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. For by fire will the Lord enter into judgment and by his sword with all flesh. And those slain by the Lord shall be many. Those who sanctify and purify themselves to go into the gardens, in other words, to commit idolatry, following one in the midst, eating pig's flesh and the abomination and mice shall come to an end together, declares the Lord. For I know their works and their thoughts, and the time is coming to gather all nations and tongues, and they shall come and shall see my glory, and I will set a sign among them. He lists all these different peoples that will come to know him. The end of verse 19, and they shall declare my glory among the nations. Yeah, 19. Then verse 20. And they shall bring all your chariots, all your brothers from all the nations as an offering to the Lord on horses and in chariots and in litters and on mules and on dromedary. I'll never know how to say the word dromedary. Okay. Which is a one humped camel, by the way. You did not, I did not know this until last week. I was like, oh, okay. Uh, on the dromedary. To my holy mountain Jerusalem says the Lord, just as the Israelites bring their grain offering in a clean vessel to the house of the Lord. And some of them also I will take for priests and for Levites, says the Lord. There's all these different kinds of people. Uh, I will bring them on one humped camels, which is another way of saying, uh, I'll even save Aaron. You know, I understand that camel jockey is a, a politically incorrect term, but that's what he's saying. He's like, there's all these different kinds of people. The guys who ride on the camel, I will bring them in as well, uh, because he, he will manifest his glory to all of the nations, um, and he will he'll constitute them as one people on his holy mountain. And some of them, he says, I will even make for priests. Verse 22, for as the new heavens and the new earth that I make shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your offspring and your name remain from new moon to new moon and from Sabbath to Sabbath, all flesh shall come to worship before me, declares the Lord. Now we could end right there. And in fact, our, I think it was, I think it was two weeks ago, we had this reading from Isaiah 66 and they cut off the last verse. And now you can see why. And I think the people on the lectionary committee need to man up. Uh, but they cut out the last verse. And they shall go out and look on the dead bodies of the men who have rebelled against me. For their worm shall not die, and their fire shall not be quenched. And they shall be an abhorrence to all flesh. And that is the end of Isaiah. Uh, he presents us with this image that uh, God will judge, and he will be just. And it's very clear which side of this judgment that you would want to be on. Um, it's a profoundly wonderful thing, you know, that Christ comes in his mercy. Uh, first when he comes initially, you know, because Isaiah is the one who tells us he'll be born of the virgin, that he'll suffer for our sins. Um, but he will come to be our judge. And this will be a very good thing for us uh, because he comes to vindicate us, to finally deliver to us the salvation um, that he's promised, and actually we get to fully enjoy, you know, all of these things. My sin is forgiven, my death is defeated, and now I live without sin, I live without death, and I live in this new creation forever. But there's always the, the converse of that, you know, the flip side of the coin is that, uh, unfortunately, there are people who persist in their rebellion, 
and uh, these words that he ends with, you know, he pictures it as he says that they're dead, you know. So, so it's like, you know, like burning garbage dump. The bodies are just strewn everywhere. And it says, the worm does not die, the fire is not quenched. That's the phrase that's picked up by Jesus. Uh, and uh, he speaks of how those who cause the little ones to stumble, you know, better for them to be cast into hell. Where there's a flesh-eating worm that doesn't die, where there's fire that doesn't go out. Uh, and this is God accomplishing all of these things uh, the way that they ought to be. So I think it's great that Isaiah ends that way. It gives you a very bracing vision of the future. Um, but uh, you, you read Isaiah understanding that it's, it's the hope and the comfort that is ours in Christ. You definitely can see, as we've talked about, um, a lot of things very similar in our world than it, as in, you know, in the time of Isaiah. That, that we see how sin and idolatry, how impenitence, all of these things run rampant. We're reminded many times about how uh, we, we've been right there on the edge, on the precipice, where I have been the guilty guy. And, and God of his grace, by his word, he warns us, he reminds us, and he also strengthens our faith, you know, through the mercy that he gives us in Christ. So, hated to rush today, but we had to do what we had to do. Um... Usually I would say, let's take questions, but today we're just going to pray. And uh, yeah, so great to have you all. Thanks for coming. Oh, no, that's all good. No problem. You got here, you know. So, all right, let us pray. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for the faithful witness of your servant Isaiah. We thank you for the words written here that we have studied that you've given by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit. Uh, we pray that uh, even faced with the prospect of your judgment, uh, we thank you uh, for the atonement that you have made uh, by your servant, Jesus, our Savior. We thank you that you have made us to be a new creation in Christ uh, by your grace and not by any merit or worthiness in us. We ask uh, and beseech you that you would always, by your word, prepare us for that new creation, uh, that we might evermore sing your praise, that we would live with you forever. Uh, and that uh, in you, all of the nations of the earth would be blessed for Jesus' sake. Amen. Okay, thank you.